first principle thinking is great but as, as much as possible do not reinvent the wheel one of the things which i always hear about operations is how much good is good enough right and um my answer to that is always 100% right so the baseline should always be 100% so what it means is you just can't screw up operations ended up becoming two things it, operations became branding right right and that's the reason my consumer came to you and operations also became the most efficient operation which made it you know uh, gave you the cost leadership right and that's what exactly what indigo did right so operations is not a cost center operations is a business as soon as you know we are at an, around 2500 uh, dollars of per capita um, in gdp per capita right um, one thing we all know is that a lot of inflection points start coming at you know 3000 dollars 4000 dollars right and that's when everything right. starts increasing problem don't focus on what you think is the solution focus right. on what is the problem Hello and welcome to another episode of the KV Curious Podcast. Our guest for today is Varun Sadhana, who is the founder of uh, Supertales and has previously co-founded Licious. In this conversation, Varun talks about how to build an e-commerce business from scratch, how to get your operations right, how to get your supply right, how to get your team right, how to get your go-to-market strategy right, and how to really solve problems through first uh, principles thinking. This conversation is more of a knowledge sharing session i would say and has been a very candid discussion uh, where uh, varun gives really compelling insights on what it really takes to build a lasting e-commerce business or a brand uh, especially ones that are operationally heavy or intensive so listen to this conversation especially if you're an entrepreneur or an aspiring entrepreneur uh, here we go varun sadhana on the kv curious podcast Hi Varun, thanks for joining my podcast. Excited to have you here and uh, curious to learn more about, uh, of course, your journey, but also about how to build an e-commerce venture from scratch. Sure, Krishna. Thank you so much for having me here. It's always fun, you know, talking to young folks like you. So I, I hope you all have fun today. Sure. Um, so you spent almost over a decade starting with Snapdeal and then Licious, and now. uh super tales all of which are somehow rooted in the world of e-commerce uh what initially draw you to the space and uh, because i think in 2012 snapdeal snapdeal was in its early stages right and i think you joined yeah. them in the very early stages so what what sort of convinced you to take that bet early on yeah actually the story started um, quite before that i actually did a startup back in 2007 um these were super early days um startups weren't you know glamorous at all uh in fact it it was a pre smartphone era I, i wanted to solve a very simple problem uh wanted a guitar teacher for myself and i couldn't find one so i thought you know is there a way i can connect people to hobbies right the hobbies that they want to do and there the the create a supply for people who can provide these hobbies um then go quite well as expected uh you know uh, now obviously there are quite a few people who do this but that kind of drove me into this whole thing about entrepreneurship it you know so that was definitely one of the last triggers which i knew that um uh, you know sometime in the future i would probably like to work in a environment where i have a lot of uh, uh, i would say open playground to do things that i wanted to do um post college so uh, you know i i did my mba from 8 to 10 uh, i went to a larger corporation so something which i really like but um you know the thing is spe- specifically when you're starting out in a large corporation the first few years um i felt a little bit constrained and i that drove me to decide ki are kuch uh, probably it's best that i move on to a company which is quite small it was a very very difficult decision back then today you know people join startups just straight out of college it's you know start startups are getting more glamorized day by day with shark tank coming in a lot of people talking about it um, i i i can tell you it's never an easy journey but back then it was even more difficult right uh, i still remember people telling me it's going to be a one way street if you move from a very large corporation to a an mnc to a startup um it's a one way street you can't come back no okay. large corporation would 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 take you back but i i knew that um, it, it was a risk worth taking um 
Snapdeal at that time used to be a couponing business, right? So right. that's uh, that's when I had uh, joined the company, and very soon it moved to being a product business, right, and a marketplace. So I I feel it's one of the best journeys that anybody could uh, hope for, right? Um, I, I always say my formative years, real formative years, for whatever I am doing today has been built at the back of Kunal and Rohit, helping uh, set up a great business and and you know. Uh, letting me be, be part of it. Um, so, so you know, I would say that I learned a lot of things down to the journey. The first I would say is something which is today, you know, people trivialize it is first principle thinking, right? The problem solving. And this is one thing which I realized, especially in a MNC where most of the time the targets flow top down and it's just not the target. Ki karna kya hai? What do we need to do to achieve those targets also flows top down, right? In a startup, I don't think anybody has too much of a time or bandwidth right. to spend on that. They expect somebody to take up a problem statement and just move on with it, right? In a lot of cases, we find out a problem statement and just solve it and then just let everybody let else know that yeah. we found a problem. If we found a problem. This is These were the possible solutions and uh, this is what we did. And a lot of times, you know, what I also realized specifically with, at Snapdeal is the, the the peer circle was pentabulous, right? So if you're going out with five solutions or two solutions, uh, one of the things which was great was the, chal- the challenging part that everybody else used to say, hey, I think there are a couple of more solutions, right? Why mm-hmm. can you think like that? Can we break down the problem even a little bit more before just jumping onto solutions? So the whole first principle thinking came about quite massively in those five, five and a half years. And I think that set the base for whatever you do Next, right? I I obviously wish this was something that maybe is taught at school levels or college levels, right? How do you right. break down the problem and and maybe uh, and maybe they do, but um, I mean maybe they do today. Uh, but that was uh, you know the if since you talked about the journey, the the biggest thing that happened at Stamp Deal was you know while managing large businesses and learning leadership and uh, chasing targets and all those. Things, but what I really learned was first principle thinking, and that, like I said, set the base for me to move forward and do something new as well. So, does first principle thinking primarily help you break down problems, or also even identify problems? Yeah, um, interesting. So, obviously, you start at a problem statement, right? You you don't go scouting for a problem statement, right? Uh, there has to be a base where you say, huh. This is what I want to do. There has to be some uh, uh, thought process as to what you are willing to do. And it's technically, it's very simple. You kind of keep peeling the onion. You keep peeling the onion to the level when the, the problem statement that comes after three, four levels is a very trivial problem statement, right? So mm-hmm. if you're able to break down the problem into multiple smaller problems, and then you attack those smaller problems, and then cascade it back and put the onion back, you fundamentally get solutions to the original problem. What, what you know, and, and how is it different from, I mean, what sometimes we see is that there is a problem statement, people jump to a conclusion, here, if the problem is X, the answer is Y, hmm. right? Two plus two is equal to two, so four. So, right, so it's sometimes as trivial as that, but what we've realized is, um, uh, there are simple problems, there are complex problems, and there are complicated problems, right? The three set of problems. So for, for complex problems, it's always best to break it down into simple problems. So think of how NASA would send uh, um, a rocket to the moon. They would break that down into millions of smaller problems and and then combine it backwards, right? Uh, so at least complex problems that way uh, definitely can be solved uh, is, is how uh, we think about it, right? So and that's that's the simple thinking about first principle thinking. I, I urge everybody listening to this podcast if if this is a subject that you're interested in, do read about it. Uh, there are very set mechanisms of you know um, of understanding it. There are very set mechanisms of bringing it to your daily lives, and uh, it just always says take a step back, identify the problem, break down the problem, keep breaking down the problem till you find the solution, and then. Um, and you, until you find multiple solution and just then cascade it back to the original problem and you will have a much better solution, right? It's a little bit time taking, I must say, but it is the right way to solve a problem. 
Okay, I, I, since you gave the example of peeling of onions, um, I just want to ask a very naive question here, right? Let's say you start out on a functional problem uh, where you know you say something um, is too expensive or something is uh, too hard as, as far as user is concerned, for instance. And then you start breaking down uh, the, the problem. You start peeling layers. And often it, it, it could turn out that the most fundamental level you reach out, uh, reach at could be a very core problem, right? Uh, something affecting uh, or something deep-rooted in psychology or something deep-rooted in uh, behavior itself. So uh, when you yeah. start out as a functional problem, you, you've effectively landed on a core problem. Now, how do you sort of bridge the gap between these two and reassemble back so that you arrive at a functional solution? Oh, this is um, quite amazing. Yeah. Uh, very, very good question. And uh, I would say these are uh, very evolved problems that you're talking about, where you start peeling the onion, but fundamentally what you find out is that you actually, post peeling the onion, you actually land up in, in another problem, right? So you yeah. have two options. Um, one which is very well accepted in the startup world is experimentation, right? So you have a problem statement. There are two ways to solve. Either you just keep peeling the onion till you get it to the very core level. Uh, and if you have an answer to that, and let's say if you don't have an answer to that, a lot of times the trial and error method also works quite well, right? And one of the ways I always suggest is do experiments at a smaller base see if there's a uh, delta, repeat the experiment at another base to see it works, and then just go all out and say it works, right? You post that, you should always figure out why it works, but this experimentation philosophy also works, right? Um, to answer your original question, see the, the real way of solving that is to, if, if you start from a, a functional problem and move to a psychological problem, then you need to peel the onion of the psychological problem as well. Right, mm. uh, because then you have to break down that problem as well to the last core. And but if if you feel that that at any time it's going to take a lot of resources to solve for that problem, uh, and that resources can be time or money or effort or capability or any of those, and in which case probably you move on to the second phase, which is sometimes experimentation. That's how at least I would approach the problem in any startup. And by experimentation, you mean start out experimenting with the solution and then uh, keep evolving a solution as you progress. Absolutely. So, you know, a lot of times people talk about UI, UX is a great way where a lot of experimentation happen, right? So think about it. Should the color of your CTA be orange or red or green, right? Mm -hmm. and, and, and this is a good problem because this is fundamentally a functional problem, right? That you right. need to increase the conversions. But as you move down, it starts becoming a psychological problem, right? That what is for the category that I am, what is the best propensity for a customer to click on that button? And and right. So now now the question is how do you solve for that? One way is that you kind of go into psycho psychology and say, hey, uh, you know, I'm in pet care or I'm in food or I'm in um, um uh, you know, let's say luxury products, and, and probably in my case, the CPAs would be, you know, you know, these colors, and there are some of some some of the things which now have started coming um, as baselines as well, you know, black and purples are associated with luxury and oranges are, you know, um, associated with visibility and reds with food. And, you know, so some of those things have definitely started to come around, right? So you can start at that base. So that's, in, that's what we call as outside in thinking. Uh, you break down the problem, you say, hey, I need to increase my conversion. What do I need to do? And you start breaking. I need to change the color of my CT and, and you start there. And then, you know, you just land up and, you know, do a lot of A-B testing. And A-B testing is yeah. a very, very accepted tool in the world. Um, uh, and that's nothing but experimentation, right? And and you say, hey, uh, between two colors, which, where do I find at a larger base of people? Where do I find better conversions? And then you choose that. And then you replace the other one with another color. So you start your hypothesis saying, I will try between these five colors because my theoretical analysis or outside in thinking or of, of my personal understandings make me feel these are the five options of colors. And then you test between those five colors and say, hey, this is for now giving me the best result. I'll go ahead with it, right? Hmm. And, and so that's how you arrive or make peace with the problem statement for now, right? Um, so, so this would be an ideally an approach and you, you keep repeating this approach on any kind of problem that you have hmm. uh, without jumping onto the solution. It kind of makes sense. The other thesis that we always... Um, I I I, uh, I say we, we you know we kind of um, believe in is is that 
first principle thinking is great, but as, as much as possible, do not reinvent the wheel, right? And now, now this mm. is interesting, and I'll tell you what it means. Um, when you're building a startup, right, there are a lot of problems that people have already solved. They have done the first principle thinking. They have done the experiment, right? Make a decently large network and don't start from zero. Start from some base by building an outside in thing thesis, right? Let's go back to the same example, right? Um, you know, I suddenly start feeling that the color of the CTA will impact conversions, right? Now, the, you know, rather than going and start doing first principle thing and doing a lot of research, have a discussion with at least five to 10 UI, UX designers or product managers to understand what's their take on this and what have they done around it. And you will find that they will give you at least a starting point where you don't have to do the same first principle thinking. Then you take those hypotheses and then do you your first principle thinking bases your uh, problem statements and, and and then solve for it. So you don't, you know, um, uh, you, you can start applying some of the formulas directly, mm -hmm. right? And rather than, you know, starting to, um, uh, you know, starting to derive some basic yeah, formulas, right? Yeah. So uh, as in any of the maths exam, right? So, you know, there will be some formulas and they would say derive this. And so you don't start Archimedes from Archimedes principle or you don't start even before that, right? right. So, so you take yeah. some base, right? So that base is what we call as outside in thinking. So outside in thinking plus first principle thinking plus experimentation is a very, very lethal combination is what, I, what, what we think, specifically from a product standpoint. Wonderful. Yeah, that, I think that's that's a very uh, concise and clear explanation of how to even go about uh, solving problems. Uh, but maybe switching gears here, right? And I want to extend this conversation into uh, your, uh, I would say, expertise in operations, or at least your experience in operations. Uh, typically, uh, at least in uh, based on my interaction with people, other founders that I know, th there's some level of apprehension when it comes to operation-intensive businesses. Uh, because there's a lot of groundwork to be done. Uh, th there's a lot more uh, physical challenges to uh, sort of solve on your end before anything can uh, even pick up, right? What is your view on this? Like, how do you approach, let's say, when you're starting to build a Licious or a Super Tales, th there's a lot of operational um, expertise that you need to put in place, be it the warehousing, be yeah. it uh, how you uh, do the delivery, a lot of these things. So how do you address these things? Is it is it sort of beforehand or uh, do you just uh, adapt to it through the process? Great. Super question here. Um, and the reason I say it is because it kind of fits a little bit, I would say, antithesis from the experimentation philosophy, right? Um, what does operation impact fundamentally? Right? And when you think about it, it's customer experience. Right, and there is this the thing about customer experience is that um, you you just can't screw up, right? Okay. And, and because you 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 know there's a lot of effort that you take to get a consumer, right? And and there is the last thing you want is that you've done everything right, and operations is where uh, the game is not there, right? So so uh, let's take the example of any platform right um for any platform if uh, if if a consumer comes to the platform and does not find the product right they're looking for it it can be a chicken curry card or in super tail let's say a package of a packet of Enlo or a packet of pedigree um you're going to lose the customer right and, and and the customer you're giving the customer another reason not to come back if the customer ends up ordering and they don't get up in, in the product in time, you're going to lose that customer. If mm -hmm. you if the customer receives the product but receives a product not what they ordered, you're not, never going to get the customer back again, right? Uh, and you can think of, you know, at least 20, 30, 40 more examples of where whatever you do, you will, you know, you are going, the customer is not going to come back. Right. So one of the things which I always hear about operations is you know how good is you know how um how much good is good enough right and um my answer to that is always 100 percent, right so the baseline should always be 100 percent. so what it means is you just can't screw up 
and hence if you think from that philosophy operation is difficult and let me add a little bit more difficulty into this already uh, a little bit more complexity into already difficult problem is that operations is cost right right there is always the finance head and in the pnl where there is this large line item which is always there right but then you go back and i like i always say there is outside in thinking and you think of there would be something with let's say southwest and south of the airline in us or let's say walmart or uh, in india indigo is a great example they would have done where operations ended up becoming two things it, operations became branding right right and that's the reason why consumer came to you and operations also became the most efficient operation which made it you know uh, gave you the cost leadership right and that's what exactly what indigo did right so so it just said if i focus everything only on operations or i won't say everything but a large part of my uh, time and effort on operations i will be able to use exactly the same thing upwards for the from a branding point of view and exactly the same thing in pnl where you know i have the most efficient cost because think of it um in airlines whoever gives you the cheaper price you'll go with that you wouldn't care if right. it's is it or, or or an indigo or a vistara you just are looking for the pricing so which means clearly everybody is playing on the same pricing mm-hmm. they have the same planes they have the same third party operations they have the they, they buy the same jet fuel so where would anybody keep create a differentiation between each other it has to be on the operations right right and 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 operation in this case they said i will keep the most efficient operations which will also be reliable so reliability then became a customer facing thing and probably the reason you will between two options you will take indigo because you you have this feeling that it flies on time better than others mm. right and, and and the reason they are able to go and talk to the shareholders is that look i'm doing a better branding i have a better customer base and at the end of the day i am cheaper than everybody else right so now this is the power of operations right and it's a very similar thing that we followed at uh, malicious as well as at uh, supertails right where where what we saw were, what we see is fundamentally use this operations to create reliability use this reliability to talk to the customer from a branding angle and use reliability plus efficient operations to make the pnl look really really good right so that's you know so now this becomes the overarching thing of what operation should be now mm-hmm. you get down mm-hmm. and now you say you, you say i don't want to create an ecosystem where delivery happens i want to create an ecosystem where i am able to do a very cheap delivery mm-hmm. but my premise is that i have to a 99.99% at a six sigma level i need to be able to you know talk to my customer and give them reliability right so you build start building the supply chain from there right now you will say well these seems to be very opposing forces and i would say the answer is no you take up a problem you say how do i you, and this is where first principle thing comes in to take up a problem and say how do i make my delivery system faster that will be dependent on the design that you design your um, operations for mm-hmm. and you say i will do first principle thinking to make my customers is always very very um delighted and then you do first principle thing on on things here how do i break down every cost that i'm say i will actually be able to build a more efficient ecosystem and this is a i would say a never ending thing right mm. but again the, now that i'm putting it it kind of breaks everything down into two problems and then the two problems into multiple smaller problems and then you keep uh, changing design which right. become more efficient as you scale right and and hence operations is a never ending the second part of operations is is a large set of people who keep doing the same job every day day after day right so it's you know and they choose to do that job but right? it's it's the company that's the uh, uh, you know the 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 set of people in the company who need to ensure that they're always kicked about doing the same job every okay. day right? because it's very different from let's say doing product work or category work or or branding work right for that matter right. where there is a little bit of newness right but think of for delivery boy they got to do the same job day after day after day and from a delivery boy you expect the experience that they need to give to the customer right think of somebody who's at the warehouse right think of somebody who's who's probably sitting in, in the head office trying to manage coordinate between with multiple warehouses and uh, multiple um, uh, you know delivery networks right so so keeping their morale 
IR is important because as a lot of it is a manual job and the day that morale goes down, there are those customers on the other side. Right. Now imagine a malicious kind of a scenario where you know one of the biggest things which is reliability, which we gave about was that every product will look the same, right? If there's a curry cut, you know, every curry cut over you know a million packets should look the same. That's the kind of reliability that that the company promises. Now, if somebody is doing the job manually. How do you keep that inspiration and 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 um, uh, you, you know um, keep acknowledging them that they're doing the kind of job that they're doing? And and every product that comes out is practically the same because there are no machines which cut uh, mm. into similar pieces, right? Um, so 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 like I said, I know it's a difficult job and it's a very very large subject which is operation. But keep breaking down and it into large parts. Look at operations as a real advantage rather than a cost center. Um, and I think then everybody in the company starts appreciating why operations are important. And um, in fact, uh, my co-founder Vinny does a brilliant job at it. I mean, he's 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 spent almost 10, 12 years in operations, and his, his philosophy is very very clear. Operations is not a cost center. Operation is a business. Right. I want to take the specific example you mentioned, right? Where, uh, let's say you, um, the curry cut, every cut looks the same you mentioned. Uh, now, initially, yeah. when you begin with, it's it's relatively easier maybe to ensure this because th- there are just specific number of people that you're dealing with. But as you scale the organization the, and you have to centralize this whole approach, uh, that, that requires managing multiple of these people, right? And it, it, it's beyond just incentives and keeping them motivated, right? It's just ensuring that uh, th- there's literally no screw up happening in any one of the cases. Uh, even with uh, even if you have two screw ups out of thousand, it's still, although it's statistically insignificant, but as far as consumer experience is concerned, it it is significant. So as you scale, how do you yeah. ma- how do you ma- as you scale, how do you make sure that you centralize these operations and still have m- sort of have that level of micromanagement so that things don't mess up? Super, super. So let's break it down into into the framework that we talked about, right? So we said. Uh, there needs to be some outside in thinking and then there needs to be some first principle thinking, okay? So let's say we're all sitting as part of a company where, which needs to do some manual work uh, and they need to do it at scale. And the question is, how do I ensure that every product coming out of this manual, it's manual dexterity, right? So how, do, how does anything, every product which comes out of this manual uh, job is is perfect right and and as an output the customer gets the same reliable output every time so the first like i said you'll always do outside in thinking so i would think of industries who have done it at scale Mm -hmm. and 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 i would think of some of the industries who have done it at scale would be you know from in a startup ecosystem somebody like an urban club right absolutely um uh, i would say fragmented industry where you know you you can get a mess over at your house a, a barber at your house, uh, you know, some of these activities at your house, and every time you get a very high quality experience, right? So, so you would go to Abiraj or, or the team and say, hey, I need to understand what you did to maintain this type of, of problem statement, especially when you are fragmented, right? The problem statement we are talking about is still central, right? Okay. So that is one. Then I would think of some examples where some of these things happen centrally, right? And I would think of where are large scale non automated. Uh, products being made and in my head i would think probably of uh, let's say airplane catering right um, the tart sats of the world right mm. because a, it's a massive amount of food getting made and trust me food at a very large level is all manual right and they're, they're cooking the meals and they're packing the meals and it's all manual and and when you go to a flight right and, and everybody gets a meal it all looks the same Right. So right. how does that happen? It means there is a very large level of Six Sigma being followed there, right? And I would think of some industries in, in a very similar manner. You go to a hotel, a, a good five-star hotel, and the person sitting at, uh, who, who ushers you inside or the person at, at the help desk, they, you know, you go at any time of the day, any day of the year, and you will find that the hospitality there is exactly the same, same, right? So yeah. the, it, it, it's a similar thought process. It's a similar how, in a manual scenario, how are they able to do that, right? And so then you come back and you say, it's it's probably three parts, right? The first part where it, everything starts is what is the design that you build? What are you doing and how does the design follow? The second part would be training people. And the training is just not one-time training. 
it's multiple time training right. right and the third would be what are the right places that you would keep uh, the quality checks and how stringent quality checks uh, and what's the empowerment that you're able to give to the quality team right mm. you build it in three parts right and then you keep breaking down what is the right design right so if i have to cut chicken and what's the right design where at least things you know do and design would be something as simple as does does the um, um you know i would say the butcher have enough light on the table to right. to see what is happening right, right. Uh, in training are they trained enough that they have muscle memory that they know this is how it needs to get mm. cut and 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 at what are those empowerments that exist for a quality team to reject a product and how do you ensure that this you know what part of it can be automated what part of it cannot be automated now just think about it in an ideal world if everything is being cut and let's say the um, let's say the final product is similar can you pass it through some kind of an x ray or some kind of a machine which is which which is able to identify the product and say hey the size and shape is in a, a absolutely mm-hmm. the specification that are given and this you know brainstorming right now so that's how you break the problem so you took a outside in view first you then you break it down into multiple problems you don't start solving for training from day zero you learn mm. how ogre people get trained you learn how tart sets people get trained you go to uh, urban clap and understand how, how is the training set up and you go and understand this training set up in some other companies you bring the best of it to your company start training and uh, qc is you know quality control is 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 as statistical as you know person dependent and and then you you get those concepts you start breaking it down and now you have a whole system which start going right and you, now you can understand that now in even in that uh, madness there is some method that you right. are quite confident that the if for whatever input that comes in your outputs will seem to be quite reliable right mm. and then you start seeing what is you probably will start at one sigma or two sigma and then you decide where do you want to be right if you want to be at six sigma then probably you have to do more steps right and that could mean design of the whole plant it can be the kind of people that get employed the kind of investment that goes into training the kind of investment that goes into design the kind of investment that goes into quality control uh, the kind of automation that you are able to bring it but all of these problems are fundamentally solvable the only thing is who wants to really solve it right if the people who care about customer right they want to solve it and a lot of times people don't right and so it's a it's a very individual choice hmm and how how do you go about picking these folks who care about solving this <laughs> yeah so obviously um customer obsession has to be one of the value systems that you drive and um you know out of the multiple value systems and uh, there are enough and more mechanism of checking this during an interview right and a lot of that um a lot of this is actually available on the internet quite well people have written how do you um you know find out customer obsession of a person because if you ask the person on the page hey uh, you know do you think your customer are obsessed i doubt anybody would rate them lower than 8 out of 10 right, right. uh but you know you, you put certain scenarios there mm. right uh, and i think you will be able to figure out um a solution so i'll just give you an example one of the question that we always ask is there is a customer who calls us right and we are into pet food um uh, you know we're into pet product um, uh, market place right so so let's say a customer calls us and says hey my product was supposed to get delivered today and it's not delivered yet right um and and you are let's say you take up the call how will you solve it right and what will you do and and obviously there is some solution and let's say the customer says that hey my product was how is your answer different in case a customer says that hey my product was supposed to get delivered yesterday and today so you get some differences right you 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 see you start getting some differences but i think some of the best uh, people who are really customer obsessed what we have found out is they try to get into the problem they say that i will ask the customer how urgent it is for you to get do you you know because you have pets they need to be fed do you have any pet food that is left which means i is it okay if i deliver it tomorrow mm. or day after basis whatever the timeline that we have and if not then 
I will figure out a solution by the way because your pet cannot be hungry. In which case, even if I have to buy a product and dunzo it to the customer, I have the liberty to do that because I'm solving the problem of the customer. I'm not solving right. the problem of the company. Right. Right. And and this is customer obsession where you know do people really appreciate the problem that you know and, mm. and 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 what we realize is you ask 10 people right and you give them the option only one or two take take it rest really appreciate the fact that you try to understand a problem and they say we understand it's late but you know you you know what i actually have some food for the next two days it's fine even if you deliver it to me tomorrow mm. right you you get what I'm saying because yeah. being empathetic and you know otherwise the customer like hey you you promised me the product today where is the product but on the other hand we, you know a person who understands who really wants to get to the problem will say um, you know if we have to deliver it right now then you know just forget what is going to get delivered tomorrow and after and you can keep that product but what's more important is let's feed your that's right, right now because right now, yeah. you know that's the fundamental problem statement right now now you would start understanding what is customer obsession and what is problem solving and and probably you know customer obsession is very very different right you you actually go into what is the need of the customer and try to solve it from there got it so I, I, again um we, we've sort of understood what might be the right way to tackle operations uh but 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 maybe extending this to marketplace and e-commerce businesses itself. Uh, strictly speaking, there's not much difference, let's say, between an Amazon and a Flipkart, except for the service that they may offer. And of course, in terms of how they design their product, which might affect uh, purchase decisions and things like that. But at the end of the day, the objective of both the companies remains the same. Uh, and please correct me if I'm wrong. The, the objective of every marketplace business is pretty much the same, where you want to drive most of the uh, purchase traffic onto your particular site or app. And in that case, how exactly do you go about building a moat or identifying that opportunity and tell, here is my different GTM and here's how I'm going to attract customers besides of discounts and uh, uh, besides of monetary benefits? Got it. Super. Yeah. Um, again, uh, and I'm going to talk largely around pet care here, right? So yeah. Um, yeah, let's talk about super tail, right? What's the fundamental problem statement that exists, right? The fundamental problem statement starts from the fact that that if you look at the last couple of years, then the number of people who have got um, pets in the Western world, right? Almost 80% of them are second or third time pet parents. Yeah. Okay, mm -hmm. the but the the thing is actually quite reverse in our country, right? When we look at India, almost ninety to ninety to ninety five percent of people who got pet who recently got pets are first time pet parents, right? Now, first of all, we know that a large set of people are getting pets. The second thing we know is a large set of young people are getting pets, right? The third thing we also know is that this is kind of a this is kind of a um I would say a reverse thesis when it comes to um, you know, any consumer brand. Normally, a consumer brand gets first in yeah. tier one and then from, from there goes to tier two. But pets is very interesting because pets was always there in tier two. And now people in apartments are keeping pets, right? So now, now with these information, let's go and understand what are the problems of the pet parent, right? And what we realize is that at this early stage of pet care in our country, and pet care is very, very, very recent, the, the problems are very core they are what we call as the roti kapda and makan of you know of human needs right mm -hmm. Hum us level pe hai bed care mein and, and for a pet those problem statements is what we call as the primary needs are nothing but you know pet products which is largely food um health care and training right mm -hmm. so ye teen cheese hai, these three things are the fundamental building blocks of pet care mm -hmm. and this will kind of um uh, you know, be there for the next couple of years, right? So it's not going to go away for, for the next decade. So okay. this is where the large growth will happen. The second part which needs to we need to understand is why is the growth happening, mm. right? What changed during COVID? So what happened during COVID was there was a large set of people who always wanted to keep pets and probably it was just a matter of time. Their purchase decision became much faster with COVID. 
right? So, so, so now you had a large set of people who always were wanting to keep pets in the next two to three years. They suddenly came around and kept started right. keeping pets. And so that was wave one. That's that kind of moved to something called as a wave two, where people who always wanted to keep pets but didn't have, but needed a reason to keep pets. And they found the reason. The reason was, and this is phase two, by the way, the reason was that they found that a lot of people around them have kept pets, right? So this is what is called as a peer network effect, right? right. Um, I mean, you buy a car because, well, your friends have bought a car, right? You have right. A, a partner because right. your friends have a partner, right? And you you buy a house because, well, everybody around me seems to be buying a house. I get married because everybody's getting married. It's a very psychological thing, right? And, and so phase is what we are in right now is people are keeping pets because they are seeing more and more people around them in cafes in parties they're talking about the pets right mm. and, and and look at them this they seem to be yeah. very happy mm. when they talk about the pets the third phase which will kick in in the next three to four years and i would uh, this is what our understanding is, is 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 the third phase will come where people who are pet lovers right but they didn't they didn't feel like keeping a pet. And one of the reasons they didn't, uh, the biggest reason why they didn't keep pets was who will take care. Right. Right. So in the next two to three years, that set of people will start keeping pets because they will find that the phase one and the phase two have kind of built an ecosystem. That ecosystem mm. is important, right? right. That ecosystem includes everything. That includes dog walkers. That ecosystem includes a lot of offline stores, online stores. Mm. It includes a large set of vets. Maybe jitani bhi problems hai, right? Those need to start getting solved, and that's when the ecosystem will get built. Now, right. now coming back, and let me just connect it to what you asked, right? What's the differentiation? If the fundamental need of a pet parent is that today the ecosystem is not built, and I need to provide for something which is the love of my life, which is my pet, I need a specialized platform which will help me not just for food or products but also for healthcare and training so the gtm then becomes a specialized platform which gives you both a product and services and is able to integrate both of them mm -hmm. right and that's what super tails ends up being right so imagine let's say krishna has a pet and krishna comes in our platform and let's say the name of your pet is coco for that matter right um and 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 krishna comes and buys some product um from a platform which is coco um uh, and let's say you buy a product um and what we'll do is we'll have we have a concept called as a pet relationship manager right and, and this person will reach out to you and say hey krishna i can see i can understand that you have a pet and you've bought puppy food which means that the pet is a puppy what's the name and you tell him and, and you start talking about coco and this pet relationship manager who's this person this person is who has had pets of their own right so they understand this journey that you are going going to go through right and by the way, the journey is not easy, right? The dog is yeah. uh, crying, howling, doesn't know where to pee, how to pee, and you doesn't know the name. And, you know, you're you, but you were very excited before you got, got the pet, right? But you realize it's not easy. Yeah. And so we'll try to understand your problems, and then you'll say, "Hey, I don't know the pet. Not eaten for two days. There's some rashes, or there's some ticks and fleas." And we'll say, "Hey, wait. Let me just connect you directly to my vet right away." Mm. And that's when the vet comes in, and these are the vets who. Uh, who work with us, they're on our platform, right? And they only work with us and, and they've been trained and they've gone through the whole cycle, like we talked about how to give the best customer experience. And, and, and they start talking to you and they solve your problem, right? And, and that's how the fundamental, um, uh, you know, real problem statement of yours gets solved. Because you had multiple issues, right? You not, you just didn't want to buy products. You also wanted the best, I would say, well-being for your own Pet as well, right? You wanted the best healthcare. You wanted to train them. You wanted to understand: Am I doing something right? right. Is milk good for my pets? Can, it, you know, can I give pumpkin to my pets? Right? I, I, uh, my my pet had like a couple of grapes, and and uh, do I you know is, is it okay? Will my pet die because of it? And unfortunately, all the information available on the internet is 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 very polarized, right? And yeah. one set of people will say nothing will happen, and other will say your your pet is going to die, and you'll say hey. I am worse of where I started from. I'm mm. sad that I had both offsets of this information and you would like to rush to a vet and you'll you'll take an Uber and two of them will cancel because they don't want a pet inside. After a lot of fight, you'll end up reaching the vet and, you know, vet does not have time because, well, there are very few yeah. vets in the country. And, and after spending half a day, which is a very treacherous, I would say, uh, day for you and the pet, you realize that, you know, most of the things are fine. 
Yeah. Right. And you wanted this information, but you wanted your peace of mind much faster than that. Mm. That's what our platform does with a customer. It basically we say, hey, we're going to handhold you through this process of right, parenthood, right? And let's do that. Mm. Right. And, and and over time we keep extending this, right? So we did almost 25, 30 odd consult, 30,000 consultations last year. Um uh, and, and we are actually going to do double of that this year, right? And and fundamentally, this is nothing but educating the customer any time a new industry in the country has been built the first thing has been education right imagine so many ads and mutual funds which talk about mutual funds say yeah that's nothing but education right um yeah. right and, and think of edtech how it grew before pandemic right people were talking about you know why the right education is important right so stay with pet care pet care is not easy it is yes it's blissful but it's a journey right so and people have to cover the journey, and that and that's where we come in and we say, hey, we'll take you through the whole journey. It's just not product, just not just healthcare, it's just not training, it's just not pharmacy. It's a combination of all of them, right? And and that's the mode, that's the differentiation, and that's how you know we play in the game that we play in, which others don't think they can play. It's a specialized ecosystem. The last bit on this is that there are certain category where you would always want specialization, right? If I, you know, I'm sure if I ask you, where do you buy your clothes? It's not going to be Amazon or more often than not, you know, mm-hmm. a better platform for that, right? If I ask you, where do you, um, you know, buy your um, beauty and personal care product from, you know, the answer is going to be a specialized. Um, yeah. case. If, uh, I, I'm assuming you don't have a baby, right? If I ask you where you buy your baby products, or baby clothes, it's not going to be one of the horizontal marketplaces. It's going to be a vertical marketplace, right? And if that is true, the same goes through for pets, which is the fourth category where exactly the same thing. Yeah. Hmm. Very interesting. But, but one more point here, right? Especially in the case of super tails, you mentioned that it's not just the food products or the healthcare products and training yeah. products. And there's this sort of educational uh, one-on-one uh, tele-consultation service kind of, uh, basically a service uh, arm yeah. that, that becomes very relevant. Yeah. But yeah. this this arm might not be yeah. relevant for most other marketplace businesses, which are just into the business of uh, selling products Absolutely. and delivering it. Uh, and with, with, for, amongst marketplaces dealing with just that, and even if we were to go back to Licious, although it's a DTC brand, but at the end of the day, it's it's sort of trying to compete with other uh, meat options available out there, right? Uh, of course, uh, you might initially come and Correct. say, this Correct. is clean and this is hygienic, and this is sort of the reason why you need to buy, buy yeah. it from us. But but on the other hand, there are enough people out there who who say, okay, this is packaged meat. But if I go to a local store, uh, regardless of the hygiene, I'm getting fresh meat, and I can always come back and uh, yeah. go to my home and clean it and do this. Uh, let's say in that particular scenario, how do you sort of convert a customer from going to the physical retail store to buying on dishes? Um, so very interesting. So, so like when you talk about meat as an industry, right, the problems statement there are a little bit difficult, right? Meat is one of the four things which is still sold in a black bag, right? Mm. But if you look at a consumer... Oh, please, uh, I, I just want to dive a bit into that. What what are the other three things? The black bag thing? Ah, so, so okay. So, so the black bag, if you, the four things in the country which still get sold in black bags, right? Okay. So um, the one is sanitary pads, one is okay. alcohol, one is condoms, and fourth is um, meat, oh, okay. right? So, so these are the four things that still get sold in black bags, right? And the idea, and I'll tell you, the, the mission that Licious has, right, is to take meat out of the black bag. So even if you see the packaging, it's actually transparent, right? Mm. Now, now that's one side of the supply side. Now, think of the consumer side. Um, any meat eater will tell you that it's actually one of the best times when they're going and end up having meat, right? It's, it's, it's you know, the family comes together on Sundays, and Sunday afternoon normally is the day when everybody has meat or... Um, if something good has happened, right? It's got good marks, so then let's let's go and have a little bit of meat, right? So yeah. meat is associated with happiness, right? So imagine something which, on one side, from a supplier side, has a little bit of taboo. On the other side, um, you know, it is it is blissful, right? So how do you bridge the gap, right? So now you take that as a fundamental problem statement to solve, and you solve it through packaging, you solve it through communication, and you solve it through multiple things, right? Now over time, the consumer starts realizing that when we talk about fresh meat, right, it's actually what matters is I 
the whole experience of going to an offline store is also not great you just pass a store which is uh, 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 we call them wet market right so the, if you pass a wet market store and and you'll realize there's a stench around it right there is a very weird stench around uh, uh, yeah. uh, around those stores the fish market is known for its, its, its stench now it's so practically that cannot be a great experience for any consumer right i doubt that would be a great experience right so so which means that a consumer does want to uh, you know have a more pleasant a, a, buying a, a experience product which is a, a pleasant buying experience right yeah. and what better pleasant buying experience is than getting it delivered at home now that, so that solves for one part the second part is the product should also be very very high quality right and quality is maintained largely because of the supply chain right and so because of that at least we built a supply chain which was temperature controlled all through right which kind of gave consumers a really really good product right mm. uh, you know to the extent that it was a product which is better than a freshly cut uh, product outside right and 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 it also gave the consumer a product with the assurance that you don't even have to clean it once we give it to you because it's already cleaned with you know ro water right right uh, so you don't you don't spoil the water by cleaning it with the your tap water right there's no need because we've actually cleaned it with our water and given it to you right so mm. so over time that assurance and to to be very honest what is consumer um uh you know we we keep talking about retention we keep talking about consumerism what is it so the, it's it's basically an art and science right the art part of it is right if you think oh actually let me put it, the science of of um you know consumerism or 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 building a good customer centric product is reliability right so that's the science of it the art of it is customer love right and you 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 combine both of them there is a large use case of why um a company should exist and lishus proved it to the world that we are being the first d2c unicorn in the country that there was a requirement of customer ki requirement to exist karti hai consumer mm-hmm. ko ek better product chahiye and for that consumer is ready to you know shell out 20 30 bucks extra mm-hmm. right and because you're practically getting a better product with a convenient convenience at home in the timelines that you kind of wanted to make that product so so yes that exists uh, okay and th- this point that you mentioned that consumer is willing to spend 20 30 bucks extra that that's very well true for let's say meat um, that you mentioned it's i'm i'm presuming it's certainly true for pet care uh, yeah but in many cases let's say food delivery for instance people are pretty apprehensive to pay those service charges uh, mm. how do you how do you get or build a conviction that in a certain category uh, there is going to be propensity for for the premium service yeah it's a you know it's, it's a good question and you know uh, over time everybody is questioning what is called as the art and the real cam right? right um that you know you, you know why will we You, we we do have more than a billion people but what's the real time of any company and i think it's a large exploratory mode what 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 is true for sure if is that there is a there is a segment um there's a large segment at every strata right so you know if you build a pyramid there is you you there are people at every part of the pyramid so, okay. so that is why you do see the louis vuitton stores in the country where nobody think nobody questions going there why is the cost of what the cost is right there right. are large stores like that and and on the other hand you have you know um every kind of stores at um you know at the lowest strata as well right so so consumerism is across right your question specifically is that you know um is a large set of people willing to pay right and and i would say it's a good discovery phase that we're going through a uh, couple of things that we know we are an economy which is growing um you know we're just reading a report that the only uh, i would say good thing in the whole world happening right now is what's happening in india right so you know we are the only country and actually the report it's a world bank report it not saying that it's at south asia right and i you know if you look at south asia practically we would be the only country yeah. uh you know they would be referring to and maybe a little bit bangladesh but i doubt any of the other two countries they would be referring to right um and and so Uh, china the growth is slowing down and, and that's the biggest slowdown that they've had they have double growth and now they're talking about you know 2 to 2 and 1/2 to 3 3.5% 3. growth in the whole decade whereas india we are talking about more than you know 7 or 8% growth right so 
So the the growth will result in a larger GDP. Obviously, that's what the direct uh, number says. But that higher GDP will also mean that uh, you know people will keep shifting their places in the pyramid, right? So uh, and that would also mean that more and more people will keep adding into um, a set of people who are then willing to pay for those services, right? Mm-hmm. Uh, what we have also seen, and, and it's also in the past, right, that um, uh, uh, every company goes or every, I would say, um, um, you know, every sector goes to that thing where, you know, first a, a small set of people um, are become loyalists and then the larger set of people start coming in, growth starts coming in and over time, um, obviously, the companies need to make money, and so they start figuring out how to make money, and they are able to do that doing using multiple ways. And, and, and over time, people are also more willing to start paying about it. Right? Uh, Ten years ago, if we would have thought how many people would have Amazon Prime, and in India, you know, they, they are increasing uh, the number of people who do have that. Yeah. A lot of people today, you know, offer uh, offer loyalty services of Swiggy or Zomato or whichever one they prefer. So, so the trend is increasing. Uh, it's um, a, you know, to be specific, yes, there is a question, what is the real time? Is it 3 million? Is it 6 million? Is it 10 million? But we know it's definitely not more than maybe 20 odd million. That would be where everything would end. Uh, mm. The three the creme de la creme would be 3 odd million or at max 4 or 5 million, but not more than that. So that's the time that everybody needs to go for. So we're not talking about, we don't talk about then, you know, more than a billion people. We still talk about a few couple of million people. Uh, you know who would contribute what everybody is banking on is that this number will exponentially grow and grow very quickly right so this should be our decade this should be in their decade and if that is going to be true which very likely it should um then it would mean that this full time real time will grow also much faster right mm. so it's wait and watch it's a lot of good stuff which is happening uh there are companies who have been there for the five, last five, seven years and they might start feeling pressure. But for them, somebody like us who, who who just came about in the last two years, probably if all goes well, we will be going to ride the wave of where a large set of people actually get right. into this part of the pyramid. Yeah. I'm just thinking out loud here when you say that as the economy grows and people shift towards the upper strata of the pyramid, uh, of the economic pyramid. Um, now it's one thing to have, uh, you know, it's one thing to be um, being able to afford something and it's another thing to actually wanting to pay it. Uh, so uh, I, I take a very interesting example for this, right? We know in this country there are at least uh, rough, rough ten, uh, north of 10 crore people subscribing to services of uh, Zomato or uh, Swiggy, for for instance, people who participate in some, some realm of e-commerce. But the number of people, uh, even if you look today, the number of prime subscribers is uh, less than one crore. So it's it's less than ten percent of the stamp that that can afford it, but is not willing to afford it. Uh, how, how do you sort of distinguish between these two? And although um, we we might see enough number of people sort of moving up the uh, pyramid, somewhere the psychology is going to remain rooted, right? Like, is ke liye to main paisa nahi dunga. Ye to free mein milna chahiye. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So uh, this is a question which every VC, every startup in the company is also going through, right? Um, I don't think I have a have an answer here, but one, one thing which everybody is hopeful for is that this is the inflection point where everything changes, right? Mm-hmm. Uh, as soon as, you know, we are at an, around $2,500 uh, of per capita, um, GDP per capita, right? Um, one thing we all know is that a lot of inflection points start coming at, you know, $3,000, $4,000, right? And that's when everything starts yeah. increasing and 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 what we also see is that if you if you take out the last 40 percent of the country right and you take the whole gdp into the rest of them we are probably at that inflection point of you know four four and a thousand dollars so after this this becomes an exponential curve right this has the power mm-hmm. curve as they say right so then the changes happen very very quickly right whatever's happened in the last five seven decades now will happen in the next one decade right there are people who say by 2030 will probably be a seven billion dollar economy or eight billion dollar or sorry eight trillion dollar economy right from three what we are today um even if we are at five think about it we've gotten a good you know 60 70 percent jump on where we are today that's not a bad number 
right um and that would also translate to a large portion of those money being generated or um you know revolving around um you know the top 20 30 40% of people right and that 20 30 40% of people is is a large set of people right and so your 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 you know whatever numbers we talk about 2 million 3 million 4 million of the real time should not just grow by the 60 70% but actually will be the real catalyst and that might grow by almost um, you know 300 400 uh percent right so 3 4x yeah. so that number might move to i don't know a good number would be a 20 or million number but uh, whatever we end at right this is the inflection point and it's everybody's wait and watch i like, everybody mm-hmm. wants to see where it goes to we have seen those differences in the last two three years as well this number is definitely growing right we've seen mm-hmm. what um misho has done for example in 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 tier um, 2 to tier 3 oh, yeah, right yeah. we've seen one flipkart has been able to do in tier 2 right so so th- that means the the first level of penetration which has happened in uh, in the non tier 1 and non tier 2s which was led by flipkart and uh, misho which earlier was a playground only for hls and you know yeah. um, decades of the world um, is a good indicator that you know in they, that set of people will also start getting ready to become um you know regular consumers right if not today then in the next 5 years if not the next 5 years in the next 10 years but that's also a large base of consumers we need to remember uh, the last part is the urbanization is increasing right we talk about you know almost 40% of people being um, in urban rural so that will in an absolute term will move from i think 30% to 40% if i'm not wrong in the next 5 to 7 years that itself will also mean that a lot of these people will start coming into um uh, you know this this set of people who will start transacting online or start transacting uh, for a little bit more premium products online and offline doesn't matter but they, the premiumization of products is happening as we speak and it will keep continuing to happen we've seen this happening across in china in brazil and uh, happening in indonesia right now korea US obviously has been there for a long time US and Europe has been there for a long time but in the newer one specifically right uh, the bricks as they call it right it's it's happened in the last few years i think yeah. it should is is we're starting of the baby so i think is the uh, end of the beginning as they call it end right so we we okay yeah it's end of the beginning and so so now it will move into a very good inflection point to move the power curve got it i i get this but but one more point i would want to ask here is we we know there are roughly around 70 crore people uh, who use internet in the country uh, yeah, but yeah. but less than i mean i think the penetration of people who have uh, ever bought something online is maybe a early double digit percentage why do you Correct. think uh, why do you think the remaining have not yet transacted online although not it's not a question of just paying a premium right uh, Mm-hmm. today you for you to transact online the possibility is that whatever you want to buy offline uh, if you buy it online it's going to be cheaper for you for whatever uh, discounts and other things that are available right and despite that yeah. being the case for a price conscious market why do you think people haven't transacted online yet super of question yaar and i uh, you know to be very honest uh, uh, i don't think i'm a expert in this space i can only hypothesize right so uh, please don't take months for that you know uh, and and probably people in flipkart and amazon would be very deeply thinking about this problem statement right? but from first principle i'm just thinking right so what would be the reasons of people who would have not uh, bought in let's say a tier 2 tier 3 in spite of them thinking that you know um the pricing could be better one definitely would be the access to um you know uh a store etc right which is much easier it might be a little bit more easy the second could be and i think that's going to be a large one which is trust right mm. unless the trust exists right so uh, you know i probably would get the product uh, and that's a trust now uh, let, let me talk about a little bit more on trust right so now think of it how did uh, when flipkart and amazon and flipkart has been you know let's talk about last two years was definitely a company which would spend more than 10 years in the country right they've done so much of branding you know and then branding would have reached um you know everybody in the yeah. tier 2 and tier 3 still as well right tier 3 or tier 4 as well right how did misho come about and and kind of was able to set up a network which was better than uh, flipkart more efficient than flipkart and they were able to reach a much larger set of people 
in tier three and tier four. And and one of the biggest reason was how what the GTM was, right? So they did not reach out directly. They reached out through a partner, right? Who basically in turn talked to some of these people, their friends, and their network, and and it kind of become like a large network. But it was people led network, and people led network brings one of the biggest things with them, which is trust. Mm. Right. If I tell Krishna, Krishna, hey, check out this product. You might like it. Right. You are more likely to look at the product than I give. You know, as a company giving you an ad saying, hey, you might like this product. Right. Mm. There is no personalization. There is no uh, trust which comes out of people from a people perspective. Um, and, and that suddenly uh, has to be one of the large reasons. The third part, which will, which can be, and it's more psychological and app absolutely hypothesizing here could be about um how um you know um as, as i say how quickly does a person want the redemption right if i'm paying money i need to see the product right and that's uh, a little bit inbuilt in trust as well and a little bit definitely inbuilt in here abhi because i paid the money i want i, I want the catharsis of what my what i've paid to you know the redemption right away right I've given you money. I need to see the product. It's right? simple as that, right? And and I can't wait. So if I've decided that I need to buy a T-shirt, I would want to do the T-shirt right away. And, and in some cases, and last would be that the categories which are easier to penetrate, which are you know a little bit lower, um, I would say average order value categories, right? Which can be staples, which can be food, which can mm-hmm. be some of the household products. Uh, you know because. You know, it it might not be as commoditized um, as it is in tier one, right? For if I have to mm-hmm. buy some as a staple, I, I'm used to it. I'll just dunzo it or or yeah. Instamart it or Amazon it, right? Um, but but for tier two, you know, those those you know, if I have to buy some clothes, it the redemption might be better if I go off and because it's it's not an everyday purchase. And if for me, it might be a purchase which uh, needs to be a little bit more. I would say. Uh, special, right? Company mm. lenient, then after that, the family will go out, and mm. as we used to do it, like you know, 20 years ago, right? Everybody will go out, and everybody will choose for everybody else, right? So, uh, if I have to buy a bed sheet, then you know, some a few people from the house will go and decide if this bed sheet looks better or the other one. If I have to buy a sari, it will be very similar. So, one of the things, you know, so this would be a last thing, but again, like I said. Imagine what did not happen in the last before last five years only happened with Misha coming in a lot yeah. of people started doing it. So, so there, there, it's not that they don't want to do it. It's the it's understanding that set of consumers and saying the solution needs to be tailor made for them. Mm-hmm. Otherwise, it's going to be wait and watch for if larger biggies, um, you know, Amazon and Flipkart of the world, where um, they will over time be able to penetrate that market. But surely they will at some level. Hmm. Uh, I, I was recently reading Cold Start Problem by Andrew Chen, where he tells that mm-hmm. you first have to optimize for supply, and then demand will follow. But what yeah. I gather from this explanation, and particularly the example for, with Misho, is first mm-hmm. you solve for, uh, or at least solve keeping demand as the uh, objective, and then uh, you can tweak your supply according to that. Because you uh, you're no. I- Going back to the trust uh, discussion, you're, you're trying to optimize for what exactly is the consumer interest here, or what is their requirement, and then you're trying to modify how you approach the supply. In this case, the reseller model. I I do feel that that's the second step. The first step has to be if I need to have a uh, you know an understanding of you know a top quality product which the consumer would buy, and then pull it through the network. But again, look. Uh, I don't think it's either or. It's and I need to know what the customer wants, and I need to create a demand for it. I need to create a supply for it. I need to create a, a efficient model in the middle to do that. Uh, that would be the baseline, and that's how it starts, right? Um, mm. So and, and then it goes, right? So you know, when you talk about a very large level, yes, I you know, yes, a um, lot of times, and a company does survive. Like I said, I think if you you have to sort out supply in the right manner, otherwise. Um, you know, um, demand generation somehow has become easier uh, as you go at least in a smaller scale. Uh, but uh, getting efficient supplies, uh, while that's also getting easier, at the end of the day, we have to remember that 
the ecosystem is same for anybody if i open a startup or you open a startup or person open a startup it's all going to be the same so those gtms are what to uh, um, uh, you know take i would say the gtm of what to prioritize you know you do your prioritize supply you supply demand or you do you supply something in the middle which connects the supply to the demand those end up being open right so i i have seen companies following all of them none of them um or one of them Hmm. Interesting. And just some concluding quick questions. Uh, if you were a 20, 22 year old fresh grad, what would you do in yeah. India today? Uh, I would, um, I would learn, I, I would actually go and do internship in some startups, right? Uh, this is going, this is going to be a decade, maybe the next couple of decades are going to be ours. I would definitely go out, learn the fundamentals of, of building a good business. Um, I would spend some time learning solving some real problems i would learn first principle thinking that's the core of at least what i've learned uh you know i i don't want to say i don't want to spend time creating reels but i would say i would <laughs> i would like to spend time learning what a business can be built right where are the opportunities i would in the next next two to three years would be a golden time to start a business um i come from the school of thought that well you shouldn't just jump into it. I think it's best to at least learn for a little bit, time, mm. get a job, just learn, just learn. Close your eyes, go to office, just learn and come back, right? And and then jump on to entrepreneurship, right? Because then you would understand what is consumer, what is supply, what is demand, how do you negotiate, what is a product, right? What is finance? Why do what is unit economics, right? These are things unless one sees you can't learn it from YouTube videos, right? Just do it right. once. Yeah, right, yeah. that's the real thing. The real problems are quite different. This is totally like swimming, right? Just mm. get you. You will need to understand. They're going to be like super bad days, super bad months. Um, they're going to be really amazing days, really good months, right? But you need to understand why those happen, and specifically, what do you do if you're having a bad day or a bad month, right? How do you get back everybody back? Mm. Learn, understand, see how people do leadership. How people learn, how people build cultures. Uh, it's going to be increasingly difficult to build a very coherent culture in the company. Yeah. You know, people work more, people work different places, people have different mindsets today. People come, people are very expressive. Um, it's not a nine to five, come to office, work and go back. People don't have defined boundaries of what they do. People don't want to get defined by some boundaries, mm. right? Um, so we, we live in very, very good times, very interesting times. Uh, I would suggest anybody, any 20, 22 year old coming out of college, um, this is your time to learn. Spend the next two to three years learning. I mean, and just go and start up, right? I mean, this, and, and, and just have a conviction on what to do. The biggest conviction that you can get is if you find there is a real problem, focus on problem. Don't focus on what you think is the solution. Focus right. on what is the problem, right? मुझे लगता है कि यार एक गाड़ी ऐसी होनी चाहिए जो उड़नी चाहिए अच्छा लगता है सुनने में, <laughs> right? But it's very important कि यार जाके देखो वो वो उसकी डिमांड है क्या मतलब right. कैसे बनेगी क्या, right? So वो so so I know it's a little bit antithesis um, uh, because a lot of people say यार then you are taking out ambition for the world. You are taking out innovation. You are taking out craziness. Yes, to some extent, you have enough and more time. We our average age is going to be hundred years, especially the next generation, right? So there is enough and more time. Twenty. Nobody is going to retire at forty. Nobody is going to retire at sixty. Uh, if the average is going to be hundred years, so it's important that uh, first couple of years just go and learn, mm. and then make the most of the good decades that we're going to have. Hopefully. Hmm. And what is one problem uh, within e-commerce that you think is worth solving? I have millions of problems, right? Uh, which I think are worth solving. Um, at a larger scale, I think cold chain is very, is very interesting. Cold chain, yeah. Uh, it's a cold chain is a very interesting problem statement to solve. Um, I also believe um, there is a large set of people who. Um, so, so we are going to have a lot of people who are into, who are going to come into the working economy, right? So how do how does that connection really help? Um, you know, how does that connect it to the kind of uh, demand for these people that exist, right? So that is a very interesting problem statement. Upskilling education is going to be because people are not going to be ready. That I feel yeah. is uh, you know while while I think a little bit tech has been 
uh, on a little bit low because we've had you know whatever little bit downturns but i think that sector is going to uh, do well that's a real problem statement specifically on e-commerce customer experience how people transact um shopify has built a good platform something like that like a dukan for india but so many other things i think there are enough and more problems in 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 consumer because consumer psyche keeps changing got it thanks thanks a lot for this uh, wonderful uh, knowledge sharing session much less of a podcast much more of knowledge sharing thanks for this varun wonderful speaking to you thank you krishna take care have a good day you too bye